So there are 340 species of coral on the Great Barrier Reef. I get very depressed, and I've had a state of mild chronic depression for a long time now. It's not possible for me to be otherwise because of my closeness with nature and seeing the way that humans are destroying this planet. For me, it's very real. It's worse, in a way, because I am someone who actually can do something about it. I am someone who is listened to, and I have made a difference. And so I have to keep on doing that. It's not as if I can say out of hell with it and, and, and go and do some gardening. Hola amigos de Mi Arrecife. Hoy tenemos una entrevista muy, muy especial. Al lado mío se encuentra el profesor Charlie Verón, un investigador, un científico mundialmente reconocido por sus trabajos con los corales. El profesor ha descubierto y le ha dado nombre a más del 20% de los corales que conocemos. Además, el profesor es el responsable en haber encontrado y delineado el triángulo de corales, el triángulo que está en el Pacífico y está formado por Indonesia, está formado por Australia, por diferentes países, si ustedes buscan en el mapa van a encontrar un triángulo, ese es el triángulo de corales que el profesor ha encontrado y ha delineado. El profesor nació en Sydney, Australia, ha hecho innumerables investigaciones y ha recibido innumerables reconocimientos. El profesor eh, estudió en la Universidad de Nueva Inglaterra y posteriormente ha estado a cargo del Instituto de Investigaciones de Ciencias del Mar de Australia. Profesor, it's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to be here. And we are very uh, grateful to meet you. It's a special occasion for It's us. Th thank you so much. Uh, this blog will be in subtitles, the, this interview, yes. for my people that speak Spanish. And I'm sure that they are, will be very, very happy to meet you by uh, our blog. Well, thank you Spanish so much. <laughs> okay, no problem. Professor, uh, do you have an aquarium when you was child? Yes, I had a, 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 an aquarium where I just kept everything I could find and stuffed it in the aquarium and, and they died at a very great rate. And um, then uh, I found, I caught a little octopus and uh, I threw everything out of the aquarium and I kept the little octopus for uh, a year, uh, died, they don't live very long, I didn't know that. And I called him Oki, and uh, he turned out to be a uh, blue-winged octopus, which is one of the most venomous animals in the ocean. And uh, but he used to come when he was called and crawl up my arm to get a little bit of crab or something like that. Uh, he did it for the whole year. Obviously, he didn't bite me. <laughs> I wouldn't have been. It wasn't known that they were venomous then. It's years later. It was a big announcement in the Sydney Morning Herald that the southern blue-ringed octopus is one of the most dangerous animals in the ocean. <laughs> yes. When when do you fell in love with a marine life? Oh, I, it, well, I was six years old and I went out onto a huge um, wave-cut rock platform near Sydney. It's all covered in, in churning water at high tide, but at low tide you can get out onto it. But it was an incredibly dangerous place to be. And I was there when I was a six-year-old little kid, um, turning over rocks and catching things. And that's where I f fell in love with it all. And uh, that love's never left me. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, you know, well, it's wonderful to... Uh, children need to be able to be exposed to the natural world. Mm -hmm. Because almost every... Well, everybody I know who... Maybe but they're a biologist or... Just they love the natural world, they've got aquaria, 
that all starts from when they were a child. And it's so important that children see, um, see this world, uh, either for real or at least in, a, in an aquarium, because in an aquarium they can sit and, and marvel at the, all the things going on. It's fantastic for kids and adults. Professor, uh, do you have any special moment that is a treasure or, or a special moment that, that are a treasure for you in your investigations? Well, I have, um, in 6,000 hours of diving, some very dramatic things have happened. Sometimes they're very dangerous. Um, but I have come across places that I had no idea they existed. And to um, find a place which is entirely unknown, nothing like has ever been seen by anybody, uh, I've had a few of those, and that's where I find new species of coral. But, um, oh, sometimes I've been in a very huge mangrove forest, and I've found all manner of things which have never been seen or recorded before, or sometimes on the outer face of the Great Barrier Reef, and dramatic things happen. Um, I was sounded out by a sperm whale, and sounded out means they're getting a blast of sound from the whale, enough to shake your bones apart. He was just curious as to what I was. He'd probably never come across a scuba diver before. Things like that. Um, it makes for a very uh, interesting time underwater. Yeah. Fantastic. Professor, in the last 30 years, we have, the humanity has lost around the 50%, if not, I'm not wrong, of the coral of the planet. And for 2050, almost all corals could be done forever. Uh, do you are optimistic uh, with the future of our corals? I think we have to have hope, because without hope we haven't got anything. But it's, it's very, very serious what's happening and it's going to get worse as the temperature of the earth increases. Um, corals are going to continue to be, to be uh, wiped out in the wild. And so I'm thinking that great big reef systems like the Great Barrier Reef, which is the size of Italy, um, it could be dead by then. Yeah. Could you explain us which will be the impact for the planet if we lost the corals. I understand that a quarter of the marine life depends on corals. Also, there's many people that uh, get their proteins from the live in the coast for living, uh, also for tourists. So uh, I, I think that it, it will be a tremendous uh, um, impact for the humanity if we lost the corals. Well, I think it's worse than that, because what happens when we have a mass extinction on the planet, where most life gets wiped out? It always starts with the oceans, and it starts with the, uh, any animal that's got carbonate skeletons, which are coral, calcium carbonate skeletons. So the first thing that happens is that coral reefs get wiped out. Um, once they got wiped out permanently, and the corals had to a new sort of animal that we have today evolved over, over 12 million years. Um, if coral reefs get wiped out, that would trigger an ecological collapse of the oceans, and that triggers a wholesale mass extinction. And it sounds horrific and beyond imagination, but that could happen sometime as the century progresses. I won't be here to see it, I hope, but um, my children might, and it is incredibly serious. But that's not believed by most people. They find something as serious as that is unbelievable. But the earth has gone through massive upheavals in the geological past, and we are triggering off such an event faster than it's ever happened before, except when a great big asteroid hit the Earth in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but apart from that, what we are doing 
in one human lifetime or a century has taken hundreds of thousands to a million years in the, in the geological past. We're doing it all of a sudden. And it's hard to overstate the seriousness of it. It's just not believed. That's the same as cl climate change wasn't believed 20 years ago when scientists first raised the alarm about climate change. Most people thought, oh, that's ridiculous, um, that carbon dioxide could, could do all the things that were predicted. Well, I'm afraid the science was correct. It has been exactly correct. And so what we were predicting back then, we are predicting forward from now, and the predictions are very, very serious for humanity. Okay, thank you. Professor, do you believe that the hobby, the reef acquiring hobby, could work together, walk together, with uh, the protection of uh, the natural reef. Um, I mean, there's some person that believe that the hobby is against the natural protection of our corals, our rivers. Uh, do you believe that we can, the hobby, work together to protect, to uh, make a, a call to the persons to protect the, the, the corals? The world over now, as many scientific institutions, have now got great big aquaria where they're raising corals, breeding them, studying from their, their DNA, studying from crossbreeding, all sorts of things. And the know-how for that has all come from the aquarium industry. So the aquarium industry has played a very big role, but that role is going to greatly increase in the future when animals, when corals go extinct in the wild and they're only kept alive in, in, uh, in reef aquaria. Now this is going to happen and so we are just seeing the start of this now. So it is incredibly important that uh, reef aquaria, they're going to take, they're going to be like zoos are uh, for, for animals that are, terrestrial animals that are going wild, uh, sorry, extinct in the wild and this is going to happen with corals, it's already happening and we need to keep these animals alive in aquaria for a very long time so that eventually if and when carbon dioxide levels come down they can repopulate reefs and the earth will preserve coral reefs but it depends on being able to keep these animals alive in an artificial environment and that's why I'm here, and that's why I think it's so important that uh, reef aquaria um, continue to develop technologically. It's also very important for young people. I, I don't know anybody who loves the wild world, be it a coral reef or a rainforest, who hasn't been exposed to nature as a young child as I was. I fell in love with the marine world when I was six years old and um, that's a very, very common story. It's tremendous. If I had my way, I'd have a reef aquarium in every school on the planet. <laughs> it's that wonderful. It teaches just kids just looking at it and thinking, oh, that's, that's look at the crab, what's he doing? <laughs> or whatever. I mean, that is yeah. so important. Yes. And that child then becomes an adult and that adult wants to look after the planet, look, look after our wildlife. But it all starts with children. That's why I think children are tremendously they're, they're vital to the whole thing and there's nothing like a reef aquarium to catch the imagination of a child. Sure. Professor, thanks a lot for this uh, minutes of interview. It was a real honor for me to meet you. Thank you so much, Professor. It's been a pleasure. Next time I speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> ok, fantastic. Amigos de Mi Arrecife, esta ha sido una pequeña nota eh, personalmente muy importante para mí, conocer al profesor. Espero que para ustedes también haya sido una nota interesante y además de interesante que nos sensibilice para entender la problemática que tenemos en nuestros eh, entornos marinos y que usted tiene una responsabilidad como acuarista de ser un acuarista responsable y proteger esos organismos que usted tiene en su casa. Como siempre les digo, 
cuando me despido en estos videos, que sus acuarios se encuentren mejor cada día. Nos vemos en un próximo video. Saludos.